Welcome to the first episode of Series 18, everyone. We have been excited to get this game covered ever since we started planning for this podcast, and now it's finally here! That's right, we are covering Descent into Midnight, and we are really excited to dive in deep on this one. Ryan, no. (laughs) Nope. 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 (laughs) (laughs) It's there. It's recorded. (laughs) Uh, But first, some announcements. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, if you missed our previous announcement, make sure you check out our panel at Gen Con because not only will we be there with James D'Amato, but also one Grant Howitt as we explore our Spire characters a bit more together. It's going to be a really fun time, so come join us and say hi, and there are plenty of tickets still available. Another great event we'd love to see you at is the System Mastery quiz show, Quiz to Mastery. I am pairing up with Jim McClure, and Ryan is joined by Victoria Rogers. And a third team has been established with James D'Amato and Aaron Catano Saez. Oddly enough, all previous guests we've had on Character Evolution Cast episodes. Coincidence? Probably. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Total coincidence, but still. It's cool. And I am still waiting for my Chimera games to post, uh, maybe next week, I don't know, uh, when they do go live. Uh, there will be five spots available in each game, so keep an eye out. Uh, I can guarantee a truly unique experience, uh, so it'd be really great to see some of you there. Next up, review time! Review time! If you want your review read on air, you just need to leave us one. You can re- leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. Um, Those are probably the most helpful, for sure, since that's where most people get their podcasts and look at reviews, and in that case, it does help us show up earlier in the page when you're searching for things. Um, But you can also leave them on Facebook, Podchaser, Stitcher, Facebook. Did I say Facebook twice? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Leave us two reviews. (laughs) Uh, This one comes from my good friend Chris, aka Iolo, from the United States on iTunes, and it is titled, Oops, All Character Creation. (laughs) Ever get tired of all of the playing of games and actual plays? Miss the early honeymoon period of meeting new characters to love? Well, do I have the podcast for you. Tune into what one listener, me, refers to as the speed dating of actual play podcasts (laughs) to meet a constant rotation of new characters made by fun people and even learn about some cool games in the process, but mostly the constant stream of new character energy thing. Slaps hood. This baby can hold so many characters. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thanks, I laughed Chris. so hard when I read this and then I also cried a little bit. Um, oh, that's awesome. Chris, you're wonderful. Everyone listening, uh, go check out the game Chris is working on called Hard Space Hustle. If mm-hmm. you want to um, learn about the game design and playtesting process, he has a podcast called Playtest where he is actively testing and changing the game that he's making and recording all of that yeah it's really neat so you can go check out chris's podcast and his game as well um and also just like listen to our show and leave us a review yeah that'd be awesome yeah (laughs) with all that out of the way please enjoy the episode Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome Richard Kreitzlandry and Taylor Labresh, designers of Descent into Midnight, the game we've been wanting to cover since the beginning of this podcast. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so, I've been seriously like, oh, this was like first on our list. I mean, like (laughs) a year and a half ago. (laughs) Hell yeah. All right. Let's start by introducing all of you to our audience. Uh, Richard, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and any other projects that you are currently involved in? 
Uh, sure. I'm Richard Kreutz Landry. I am a software developer by day who writes educational math puzzles for kids. Um, and in my my not so copious spare time, um, I do origami art, and I am working with Rich and Taylor on Descent into Midnight. And what about you, Taylor? What kind of stuff are you up to, and who are you? Um, my day job is not glamorous and I actually hate it. So, um, I'm not going to talk as much as, as Richard is, uh, but I am Taylor LaBrush. I am the host of the Game Closet podcast now on the Stop Hack and Roll podcast network. We are an informal chat show where we talk to all sorts of amazing queer and LGBT plus tabletop role players, uh, game designers, podcasters, streamers, archivists. I always throw the archivists part in there because I think that's really cool. Um... (laughs) I also design games, which you can find at riverhousegames.itch.io. Right now, and if this episode is releasing before the end of Metatopia 2019, you can get all of my games half off, or you can get all of them in one bundle for only 20 bucks. Ooh. Right now, that's nine games, and it's 59% off. Um, there will be more. Nice. Very cool. And I have to strongly recommend Game Closet, not just because I was on it, but like, <laughs> it's so good. And that show has made me cry so many times. It's just, <laughs> ugh, it's a really good show. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah, and also, I was you. on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into this. And we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? What's in a game? Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Since this is a new game, uh, can you give us a quick pitch for the game and talk about the genre, the setting, uh, etc.? Oh, Taylor, I think this is all you. <laughs> <laughs> Descent into Midnight is an underwater alien powered by the apocalypse game, exploring the depths of the sentient mind. Uh, What that essentially means is we are going to be playing strange underwater creatures in a world where humanity has never existed. Um, We're going to tell emotional stories about community, togetherness, uh, and the fight against corruption. Uh, Along the way, we're going to figure out what's important to ourselves, and we are going to try and really uh, tap into empathy uh, community building and um, and and trying to find the root of of our identities. Uh, it's a really fun game that um, gets really deep. Pardon the pun there, um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, into like a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I love it. It's honestly it's one of my favorite role playing games, which is great because I'm designing it. So like it helps. <laughs> it I helps mean, that I love it. Uh, yeah, I. I- it's going to be really hard for me not to spend this whole time being like, this is the best game ever. <laughs> um, but it is. And I've played it three times now. And I, I've made a point now to make it the first thing I do at a convention. Because so oh my far, God. my conventions have gone quite well mm-hmm. after playing it. And it just like, it so far has set such a tone and like such a high mark for everything else to meet. But like... Every time I've played it has been so emotional and so memorable and like it just, ugh, it's, everything's good. It's very Mm. good. (laughs) It's just really good. Yeah. This is going to be a very good recording because it's just going to be a lot of really nice words and I'm Mm going to just blush Uh a lot. Yes. I said, that's what Alex (laughs) Roberts said when she came on our show too. She's like, oh, this is really fun. I can just sit here and you say nice things at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This (laughs) That was a very good (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is the first Powered by the Apocalypse game I've ever played that wasn't my own game. Oh, that's game. right. And this this is the game that made me get Powered by the Apocalypse and also <gasps> was the quintessential piece of information that I was missing that helped me completely redesign the game that I'm working on. Oh like, my god. I, yeah, that that was so cool like sitting and talking with you about uh about Chimera cuz it was just like you know, because I think like you were one of the first people I saw in the hotel yep. at, at a catacomb, yep. right? And we were just kind of like, I'm like, I recognize this person <laughs> from the interwebs. Yep. Um, and we got to talk in and and then uh, got to play test your game. And like, it was it was great. Mm-hmm. And like seeing it come along and, and like the, the weird thing for me is that like this was basically my first attempt at a like any sort of game design thing. Um and you know coming from a background of all d20 and hard sci-fi and this and that and the other it was just like gonna go out on a limb and then like just to have that immediate feedback of like hey this had an impact on somebody else like in the way that it was like changing my thinking too was really cool yeah absolutely 
Yeah, I think now that I'm thinking about it, this is the first PBTA game I played too. I think right after the first time I played this, the very next thing I did was to go and play Masks. But mm-hmm. this was the first one. I'd never played a PBTA game before. We talked we about them on the show, but not actually touched them. <laughs> <laughs> we owe a lot to Masks, I guess, mm-hmm. in terms of like a game design genealogy. Um mm-hmm. A lot of the mechanics are based around the sort of like emotional storytelling that Masks mm-hmm. does. So uh, all of the stats that you'll be rolling, if folks are not familiar with Powered by the Apocalypse games, the core crux of the uh, the game design is to do something, you do it. And occasionally you might bump into mechanics. Those mechanics are called moves. So you'll have triggers like when you, uh, when you spend downtime tending to your garden or when you uh, give in to violence. Um, these are things that have to happen in the story for your moves to happen. And then when your moves do happen, you roll two six-sided dice. Uh, and you apply bonuses. Sometimes those bonuses uh, come from your stats. Mm-hmm. Um, unlike some games, we don't have stats that are intrinsic, like facts about you. Um, I get really frustrated with games that are like, you are this many points of strong. <laughs> um, but what I do really love is games that um, that have your emotional stakes uh, tied into the mechanics or um, like a narrative positioning uh, I think one of the coolest games out there right now is Brandon Leon Gambetta's pa- uh, Pasión de las Pasiones, mm-hmm. which is a Powered by the Apocalypse game that rolls with questions that you answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that serves two purposes. The first is uh, it means that you are leaning in as hard as you possibly can to the genre because all of those questions um, are are genre beats. And then the second, it, um, it encourages you to make sure that you are using the right move. Because if you are looking at the move that you're trying to do and you can't answer yes to all, like a lot of those questions, like maybe this isn't the right thing for you to do right now. And you could take a step back and look at the story and say, what is the right mm-hmm. thing? Um, it's a very roundabout way of saying, we owe a lot to masks, so I'm very happy yes. that you played this game and then were inspired to go play that game. <laughs> well, and also, you know, like looking at what Rich loves, it's no surprise that you know he was down to to get some masks action going in there because he's Mister Young Justice. You know, oh yeah, oh for sure, <laughs> Young Justice. <laughs> and I think that this game appeals to me because of those really strong emotional story beats that those are things that I really like in games is just like, Mm -hmm. I mean, just being absolutely devastated. Um, (laughs) I'm trying to remember (laughs) we did in the, in the secret archive, um, my friend Jude and I did a Gen Con wrap up and we were talking about our, Mm. our game and we were both like, I don't know. It's like, it's, like that horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach, that like nervousness and like, but like in a good way. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know how to yeah. describe it. It's underwater fish horror. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but like so emotional. And it was just like every time I've walked away being like, holy crap. Like I feel, I mean, feel I, it feels really weird to you know? be like, oh, I feel changed or like mm-hmm. different. But like it's, yeah, I yeah. mean, it has reframed how I play a lot of games. This is the first time. That I experience collaborative world building, for example, because mm-hmm. I've played mm-hmm. a lot more like crunchy systems. And um, I, yeah, this is just, you guys, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just really good. I have so many sound and- bites of me just, <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> We're going to need a super cut of that for the Kickstarter, please. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And you can all set it as your ringtone. It's just really good. Yeah, yes. (laughs) (laughs) You're doing cool stuff. Okay, so now we can can get back on track with all of us, you know, now that we've gotten out (laughs) of the way, the part where we just tell you how great you are. Uh, we can move on to the next section of the episode. Wait, that's over? That's done? Uh, There's no, no more We'll come back to it. It's like three or four times in the outline. Don't worry about it. Okay, I was going to say, I'm going to quit this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question we like to ask is, what sort of things do you need to play the game? If somebody wants to sit down sure. and try out this game, what kind of stuff do they need to have in front of them? Uh, well, they're going to need uh, a playbook, which, again, we have uh, the playtest version of those available on the website at descendantomidnight.com um but also you want a writing utensil and uh two six-sided dice um and that's pretty much it you also need you know some move sheets uh for reference and the guide will want uh, a sheet to take notes on uh both the sanctuary that you build together and all of the world building stuff that you do together as well 
one thing that we have actually added for this recent build that's on the website, DescentIntoMidnight.com, <laughs> is What was that website again? Sheet. It's DescentIntoMidnight.com, and I'm very glad that you asked. <laughs> um, so we, we have playbooks for all of our characters, but we also have actually just recently added a community playbook mm-hmm. as well. Ooh. Um, and that's something that I'm particularly proud of because it came out of a lot of playtests at Metatopia this year. Um, and it was a very like spontaneous um, crystallization of, oh, here's what this game needs right now in this moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that is something that is really, um, it, I don't know if it's necessary, but it's very integral to what I think is like the ideal play of this game. Um, is being able to visually represent the community that you exist in, as well as the harmony and the corruption that that um, bless and beset uh, your your community. So, um, as you play, you are drawing on your community, you are defining things, you are creating a physical representation of this world that you're building and and the magic that lies in it. Uh, and then you have tokens that, as you progress through the game, you'll be interacting with two trackers on your character sheet, harmony and corruption. Um, I'm sure that we have enough social connotations that you can tell which one's good and which one's bad. Uh, (laughs) But as those progress on your character sheet, you will be actually putting tokens into the world uh, to represent the effect that your characters are having. Mm -hmm. Um, And that community playbook is something that is really, really tied everything together uh, as a way of saying, like, this is a real thing. Nice. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to... (laughs) <laughs> Try that out too. I yeah, no I signed up to play a game at Gen Con um, with Jude again, so I'm hoping that he doesn't try and destroy the world again because that <laughs> seems to be his jam. Uh, I mean, but it, like you know, it's it's a good it's a good trick. It is, mm-hmm. but he's done it in every game we've played. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so I'm really excited to try it out now that you have this in there because I I think I. I want to ask about that because, I mean, and probably this is a question in our discussion section for later, but I'm going to ask it now because I want Mm -hmm. to. Um, Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to have those kinds of like aha moments where you're sitting down you're like, this is the thing that finally clicked into place? Like, I think early on, I had one of those moments with the the, like meditation, the guided meditation, Mm. um, where... You know, th- this idea of we want to bring people together into a space where they can, you know, communicate effectively with each other. We can sort of lower those barriers um, between each other and and those emotions and kind of explore those things. How do we get into a headspace to do that? And I went, oh, wait, I, I did something like that a couple of months ago at this, you know, this taiko drumming class. <laughs> um, and I was like. Hey, that's actually a really cool technique, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that there are other games that have done that before. Um, I wasn't necessarily aware of any, um, but like it, it turned out to be a really cool thing. Cause it was like, Oh, it, it brought a lot of things together for like, how do you enter that like play space? Mm-hmm. Um, and how do you exit it as well? Um, because it sort of gave it a framework for like, okay, you, you, you all sort of like take a deep breath and sort of describe where your character's headspace is at the beginning of the session. And then you do the same at the end and you get to like have that reflection of like, how did my character change? And like, how did this affect them? Which is something that like, you're just not going to get in a lot of games. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, like Taylor, I remember, was it, was it at a catacomb where, where you were trying the, the token thing and you were telling me about that, like, that was really cool. Like that moment of just being there and talking with you of like seeing that excitement of like the thing that you were going to do, you know? Yeah. Cause that was like, that was literally the next weekend after I had like done it at Metatopia. So I was still Mm -hmm. like buzzing. Um, and like that, that aha moment power is one of my favorite feelings in the entire world. And it's the reason why I've written 20 games. Um, is that like when, when it, when that inspiration hits you, like you can't do anything else but work on the thing that you love and the thing that is stuck in your head, like right there. Um, and you know, it's, it's like maybe, it's something that I love and maybe this is a weird thing to say. It's something that I love about my bipolar depression is like my, my manic phases, my phases where I'm like on the upswing (laughs) and high Mm -hmm. tide and like, Mm -hmm. I feel like I can fight the sun. And then like, 
I get, I, I'll get this idea and I, I just like my, every cell in my body screams to like put it out into the world. Um, and it's, it's so euphoric and it makes me so happy and fulfilled. So, um, when that happened, I was like riding a super, super, super high, high tide. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to say that's how character evolution cast happened was the, I mean, it was the first time that I like (laughs) recognized that it was a manic episode, but I, I mean, poor Ryan was getting like (laughs) a text message every like 20 minutes. And I was like, what if we did this? And we had a show and it was about this and it was like too late. I've already emailed James D'Amato and asked him to come on our show that I just made up right now (laughs) because you have this like, it's, I mean, it's not healthy and you should probably medicate it. And I do, but (laughs) Those mm-hmm. when you know if it's a thing that you have to live with, um, it's nice when you can right. channel that energy into something, and it feels mm-hmm. so good when you can like put it into something that yeah. feels like creatively empowering too. Because you're like, I have used this, I have made something tangible, mm-hmm. and it's out in the world. And then you get that feedback from people too of like, hey, mm-hmm. this thing was cool. It feels yeah. really good. Yeah, and like I'm sure Richard could attest to this. There have been like nights at three in the morning where I'll just put into our group chat like, hey guys, just added three pages to the group doc. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, I feel bad for people sometimes that are collaborating <laughs> with me on things because I'm like, here's everything all at once. Let me just vomit ideas yeah. on you. <laughs> <laughs> but and sometimes I mean, they're good. <laughs> really, yeah. I mean, it's been really cool though to like watch Taylor's process and I know, you know, um, I, I feel like we have sort of arranged our trio into sort of a weird, like, I, I feel like we're on a scale of, like, Rich is the, like, hard sci-fi-ish e thing, like, and the PR person. Taylor has got the, like, the, the poetry in rules, like, somehow mashed together beautifully. And I'm sort of, like, sitting here in the middle going, oh, okay, yeah, I, I can pull some of these things together and, like... You know, Rich has got his things that he does, you know, and he'll like have his bird of, of he's going to do a bunch of stuff. And then, you know, Taylor, like just knock stuff out of the park, you know, left and right. And like, yeah, it, I love working with these people. Like, <laughs> so I want to ask about that, too. I, I mean, sorry, Ryan, I'm just crushing our outline. It's fine. We'll just do all of it now. That's fine. Oh. How how does it feel to, I mean, and particularly Taylor, especially because you do a lot of game design, what is the big difference in collaborating with other people versus doing it on your own? Because I know for me, an, yeah. like when I've like I've just started to dip my toes into it, um, I I don't know that I could do it without collaborating with somebody else because I need that like back and forth to bounce ideas off of. But I'm mm-hmm. sure that it complicates things too because you don't always have the same idea of what things should look like yeah this might be an ugly answer but like sometimes it's really frustrating um (laughs) because i'll have a very strong idea of like i know this half like my heart says this song is true and like (laughs) um and then you'll put it in there and um and it will be not what someone else's heart says the song is true Mm -hmm. And trying to, like, reconcile those two harmonies together is difficult. Mm. Um, like, I'll, I'll use an example of, like, our violence move, mm-hmm. uh, Unleash. Um, we had many, many talks about yes. that sp- one specific move and, the, like, the build of it. And even now, it's still in like it's still the only move in Descent into Midnight that works how it does because it roll or it rolls with questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that the three of us will ever reach a point where we are all three <laughs> happy with it. <laughs> yeah, and that's fine with me. And um, like that has been the big lesson of game design is that like <laughs> sometimes you don't have to be overly joyous about your game. You just have to recognize that like there are. There are parts of it that mean more to other people, uh, just Mm. as there are parts that mean more to you. And finding that balance of saying, like, hey, I really want to make this part mine, and I can see the love and support that you have for this other part over here. So let's find compromises that make us at least, like, decently happy with it. it." Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, like, I know um, if... If we were doing this with people that we didn't respect as much as I think we do, like, it would be a lot harder. Um, You know, like, I, 
from where I'm sitting, I'm sort of like in the middle of things, um, as far as like, you know, crunch and, um, sort of a, a narrative tone and all that. Um, but so I think somewhere between, um, you know, Rich and you, Taylor. Um, and I think like, like you said, we have had long and many conversations about different parts of the game. Um, and I, I think, you know, there, like you said, like there are things that just like are never going to be exactly what all of us want. Um, but I, I think it's been just a great learning experience of like how to sort of know when to go, is this good enough? And like when to push and when not to push. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and just to like, sometimes you go, you know what? Like, I love this thing that we're creating together and I love, you know, like you too. And sometimes that has to be enough to be like, okay, like we're making this thing together and it's not going to be exactly what we want in every place. But like, as a whole, it's a thing that does a beautiful thing. And it like, it's, it's a thing that we have done together and that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And you appreciate that too, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, for myself, I came from, uh, designing Chimera myself, just hundred percent solo. And it mm -hmm. quickly became something that was too big for just me. And that's mm -hmm. when I pulled in Amaraz, um, to co-design with me, uh, because I didn't have the technical handling of the GM's tools or certain mm -hmm. other aspects of Powered by the Apocalypse and not having that person to kind of play off of in real time, pretty much any time that we were designing, um, was, was difficult. So as soon as we added, uh, as soon as uh, Amaraz joined my team, then we were able to kind of work off of each other and, and progress just skyrocketed. Yeah, yeah, I think I there's think a lot brings... of value to that back and forth that and, mm -hmm. yeah. and different perspectives too, because different people are good at different things. Mm -hmm. And um, but it, I think I can definitely see even in my own experience how it does complicate things sometimes oh, because yeah. you're like, no, I, I need you to, I just need you to understand this. Will you just <laughs> shut up for a minute and like let me tell mm -hmm. you how it is? And it, especially when it's something creative, because you're like pouring your soul into mm -hmm. it, it's really hard to have somebody yeah. say. Mm, I don't really love it. Like, I don't think that doesn't I, feel I don't good. Think that, I don't think I've had that experience yet. <laughs> oh, you'll get there. Probably. I, was, <laughs> I, I guarantee it's going to be coming. I was going to say, you, you will. Yeah. Um, but it, it's but interesting. I, I think, yeah, I think like one of the, one of the lessons though that, that came out of it for me is, you know, I, I love this game, right? Like it does amazing things and I have loved working with Rich and Taylor, um, but I think like it's it's important to like start the work with people that you respect and that you love because it's like it's going to be hard at times, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I I don't know I I feel like I am closer to both Rich and Taylor after having gone through those experiences and having those conversations and like you know working through those difficult things. Um, and like I I wouldn't trade that for you know having put out a game myself you know a year ago you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I feel like I was maybe a little bit too harsh when I said what I said there. Like, I, I also really think that, like, it, this is not a game that I could have made by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, it is a game which is so much infinitely better by having other people read my words and say, like, this doesn't actually mean mm -hmm. anything. It's just a bunch of words <laughs> that, like, sound nice next to each other. So can we yeah. actually make this move do something? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the editing process is important mm -hmm. in any kind of writing or yeah. creation. And I, yeah. I think the nice thing about having people that you collaborate with is that they can in a lot of cases be real-time editors for you and yeah. say i don't understand and Rich has been really doing. cool about saying like hey the this is the direction where i'm like this is my idea for something i feel really strongly about like this this flavor tone like this playbook like he wrote the new three that we have mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's been really really cool and richard's like I still think that the coolest thing that has ever, like, the coolest innovation about this game still comes from Richard's, like, hey, what if we just had, like, a guided meditation to start the game? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's so cool because it's, like, not really even a mechanic so much as, like, mm -hmm. let's sit down and set the tone mm -hmm. for what we want. It's, I really yeah. like those kinds of experiences that, mm -hmm. um, 
that acknowledge the fact that this is happening in the real world you know so like it's yeah. i love immersion and i love being in the game but i also think it's important to acknowledge that we are all people sitting around a table mm-hmm. right and, and so i like I, those things that can kind of mesh that together and by acknowledging that you're at the table like improving the experience in the game mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well and like i i have always been one of those people who like you know i will see the articles about like oh here's all the cool stuff you can do to you know like turn your 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 you know craft room into a dungeon and have you know like decorations and have candles and mood music and playlists and i'm like that is all a hell of a lot of work uh-huh. But you know what I can do is take three minutes to say, okay, we are going to do this thing together. Let's take this like little bit of time Mm -hmm. to say this is a like, you know, I, I hesitate to say like a sacred space, but like to, to special space. Yeah, exactly. It's like you, you create like a special like atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Rich can speak more to the spirituality of it, but like, you know, to, to say like, this is the thing that we are going to do and this is something we are going to do together and we will at the end of this we will come back together to experience this journey like together Mm -hmm. reflect on it and like it makes such a huge difference because it's like how many one shots of D&D have you walked away and gone hey that was really funny when the goblin did X Mm -hmm. you know and you're like that was cool you know but like you don't think about like oh well did my character have an experience that changed them and like by doing that you're sort of echoing the thing that you're doing for yourself is like, how did this experience change me? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's one of the big mechanisms that like makes it feel so powerful is you like, you actually spend a little bit of time and effort to think about it. Yeah. Um, And it forces you to do that. I think it's especially important in a game that has the tendency to get really emotional because you sort of need to have that shared space with the people around Mm -hmm. you to say like, and especially in a one shot at something like a convention or, you know, where you don't necessarily know the people around you always Mm -hmm. that to have that moment of like, okay, we are going to have this coming together kind of a thing to Mm -hmm. recognize that we are all about to have a shared experience. And it's important to like, acknowledge the fact that this might be uncomfortable, but we're okay with each other and all that kind of stuff because it can be really overpowering sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's so strange to play this kind of game, especially with strangers, because like in my head before this gaming was, yeah, we're going to sit down and, you know, go kill some goblins or blow up some big giant robots. And like, you know, I could be playing a video game and doing the same thing. This is just doing that at a table with some friends mm-hmm. or whatever, you know. And it's like I can go to any con anywhere and be like, hey, look, there's an open seat at the table. Let's sit down. Let's roll some dice. Let's kill some stuff. Yeah. You know. And yeah, that's- and that's that's a difference that, like, I, I know they talk about developmentally in kids, the idea of playing together mm-hmm. versus playing next to each other. And I think that at a lot of conventions and even, you know, even in some kinds of games where you're not necessarily like engaging in that way, that -hmm. there's the tendency to feel like you are playing next to each other. Mm -hmm. Like, this is my character and my character's doing the thing Mm -hmm. and your character's doing the thing, but like we're not not doing it together. And so I I think for me, I prefer games where you are playing together versus playing next to each Mm -hmm. other. Yeah, I really love how this game kind of puts front and center bringing people together to help Mm -hmm. bring a community together to face off against this thing. But it was also created by a a micro community of developers as well. (laughs) So, like, everything is around people coming together to create something amazing uh, from the development down to the stories that are being told and we're going there for fulfillment too. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, we're, we're finding people who, you know, can do the layout and the art and, and all these things that like, we, we want to get like, we, we want to do this together as a group and like, you know, get everybody a little bit of work and, and make this cool thing and, you know, like produce a thing together. I'm, I'm super excited to have a, like a book, a physical book in the real world that I can point to and go, I made this thing with these really cool people, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, in talking about, like, building it as part of a community, like, I, you had, you guys had Devin George do some of the art for it. And I mm-hmm. think, I mean, if I remember correctly, like, Devin and I were in the game at a catacomb together. And I think that yep. that decision developed from the fact that we were all sitting around and Devin's over there, like, doodling our characters. And it was like, oh, oh 
She's very good. <laughs> um, so I, I think, I think somebody had mentioned that Devin was an artist, but that was after the conversation that Taylor and I had had where, you know, he'd come up with the, the idea for doing this map and then trying it out and like had reminded me about it. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's a thing. I have to remember to do that. And so I, if I remember right at the table, I was like, Hey, Devin, you're an artist. Do you want to just like, you know, sketch something to be like to, to visualize what we're talking about as we were doing the world building portion. And then all of a sudden at the end of the game, we look over and just, there's this like crab creature thing that was basically the thumbnail for the sketch that's now on, I think <laughs> the cultivator playbook, like this amazing art and like, um, and it, it all sort of like fell into place where it's like, you know, Taylor had this great idea for, you know, the, the community playbook and the map. And then that led into that experience in that game. And then like bring it up as, Oh, we should visualize this. And then like going on from there, it, it's just, and it's been so cool. Like, I mean, and she had sent me so like one of the progress pics, like when we were recording mm -hmm. for her episode and it was just like, it's so cool. Like, Oh, this is a game that I played and this is a world that we created. Yeah, and now it's like yeah. part of the <laughs> game. Now it's in there. Like that feels amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking yeah. of this world, uh, getting us a little bit back on track for our outline. <laughs> um, <laughs> we just answered, like, I mean, the thing is we've answered like the whole next question. I know. Right. Already. I mean, so, yeah. Now. What do, what do characters do in this game? effectively uh i mean the players cry sometimes <laughs> but um the characters but, return. not, not the, the characters yes. <laughs> um i mean like the the sort of central it's not really a villain of the game but the the and uh, the antagonist right um is this corruption so corruption with a capital c mm -hmm. um and we, we basically designed it to be something that is some sort of existential threat to the community. Um, now, in my games, um, because of just my gaming background, uh, I typically go towards, especially for one shots, um, we build the city together and usually there's something spooky or, or weird or interesting and that's where the big giant goo monster is going to come from. <laughs> Um, you know, where it is sort of a physical manifestation of corruption that may be coming out of the, the, the echo or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it really can be a lot of different things. Um, I know in one of the very first games, um, Taylor ran, uh, it was basically this like bleaching where it was just killing things off, um, mysteriously, um, and it, it can be, you know, also like, um, you know, emotional, um, disconnects between people in the community, right? Like maybe, um, it's just, uh, you know, discord or, um, you know, people not talking to each other or like corruption, like you might think of, you know, in, in just like society at large of like, you know, people being selfish or looking out for themselves, mm -hmm. um, and so the, the player characters are, um, a team of psionically gifted guardians who are protecting their, um, their city or their reef or their community, uh, against that in whatever form it takes. And I think every time I've played it, that corruption has been so vastly different because it obviously gets defined, obviously, uh, uh, we haven't talked about that yet, but it gets defined by the people at the table. And so it's always fascinating to see what people come up with. It's been, mm -hmm. um, I want to say in one game, it was like that just like new children weren't being born. And I, was mm -hmm. it, there were like the moons or whatever, right? And one of them was dark. Yes. And, mm. Yeah. There there was uh, a, a void in the echo uh, that wanted to gain sentience and the spirit following Jude's character, who was like a seal or something <laughs> around, yeah. like, like sacrificed itself to give this void creature sentience, I think was the, the finale of that oh, game. Wow. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He just like let the corruption eat his own sentience or something. It was very weird. Mm -hmm. Um, there was another one where he was like talking to, uh, this like ancient being, um, through the echo and we were like, don't do that. Yeah. And he's like, ah, it's probably fine. It was not fine. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that I think is it in a nutshell, like bare bones, the characters, you know, we want your, we want the characters to come together to overcome some sort of corruption to make their community mm -hmm. better. Um, along the way, 
that becomes much and like more of a complicated thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, as you engage with corruption, you take it into yourself. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our characters will become corrupted or affected by the corruption. Um, which means that their community is going to become corrupted and affected by the corruption. Um, and, there's fallout for that. Uh, one of the things that we really always encourage the guide who is our, our GM or facilitator of the game to do is to ask, so how do you feel about that? Um, and try and push things through from a, a feeling rather than an action standpoint. Um, and so I, I guess Richard is very good at like being like upfront and succinct with his games and like, <laughs> hey, here's the story, here's what we're doing, and I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm over here like, yeah, what if we just didn't have a story, but just like all felt different things yes. at different times? <laughs> I have um, to say, though, that, like, playing with Richard, at one point, he literally, like, leaned back and put his hands behind his head and just watched us ruin things for ourselves. <laughs> it was amazing. Because <laughs> we just, like, kept making things worse, and he's just like, I'm just watching this happen. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I I think that there's something that, there's a phenomenon that's happening with our playtests and with the con games that we've run, which is that if you have a short game of Descent into Midnight, a lot of bad things happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. And if you play multiple games of Descent to Midnight, a lot of bad things happen, and then you fix a lot of them, yeah. and you come together, and you find that synthesis between all of the characters playing, and it ends up in a really harmonious place. But because there's, because we're all doing these con one shots and like play test one shots, mm -hmm. it's just like the game is getting this reputation of this like emotional heart wrecker, <laughs> like <laughs> destruction wrecking ball of a game, and it's like, yeah, it could do that, but like god imagine the positive emotions too. <laughs> yeah. there is hope in there somewhere yep. you just have to stick yeah, it out for a minute be. <laughs> and, it, and i um, think you know like like you said like with a one shot it's very like okay we've just spent 30 40 minutes building characters in a world or whatever okay we've got an hour hour and a half to fill let's do the thing what's the obvious thing this is the corruption let's go um yeah. where like you know the the things that people build are beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I, I think that's one of the things that um, really is the strength of the game is that like the, the cities and the communities that are, are built up to, to have these issues are just amazing. And like, there is always some nugget of just like, of, of the, the like beauty and wonder of life and the ocean and connection with the community. Um, but like you said, it's like in a one shot, it's let's take a wrecking ball to it to, to, to hit those emotions hard, you know, um, and like you you end it and you go, OK, you can see where their corruption is coming and we've all felt these things. But you're you're like you're at that point where it's like this is the part in the story where it's like, OK, the thing has happened. And in a novel, the next part would be like dealing with the consequences of that and coming together and building up until you can face the next challenge mm -hmm. together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, like it, I think it'll be really interesting to hear um, from people as they play longer games, um, like how that sort of balances out um and I, I know we've talked a lot about the corruption but um i know taylor mentioned the harmony mechanic um and so like as your characters are encountering the corruption and all these things they're gaining um corruption and it's you know bleeding out into the community and everything but also as your characters learn and come together to face it um they're building harmony with each other and also with the community and there are these tokens that you know you can place on the map to represent like the community healing and coming together and how you're addressing the corruption um and i i think that's an important part that again like you don't get as much of in that shorter mm -hmm. um time slot yeah i really am looking forward to hopefully at some point being able to play like a campaign of it because i mm -hmm. i want to see how all of that plays out and like how you know if you deal with this horrible corruption and you know like how you're changed after that and how that affects things moving forward because that's always fascinating to me too yeah i think that we can skip the next several questions because <laughs> i think that we've gone into it yeah no kidding yeah um basic terms and concepts we've talked about what Powered by the Apocalypse is. We've talked a little bit about moves and playbooks. Is there anything else that you think 
people might need to know as we go into character creation? Conditions are something that we have not talked mm-hmm. about. Yes, yes, let's talk about them. Um, so all of our stats are emotions or dri- uh, not drives, emotions, um, ideals, um, like things that are important to you. So they are like hope, community, altruism, drive, and calm. Um, and as you, you know, as the story does bad things to you, mm-hmm. we'll put it that way politely. Um, the story does bad things to you. You may take conditions which don't represent necessarily your character becoming like physically harmed, but the important like struggle that we want to tell stories about is our like struggle with emotions. And mm-hmm. um, so instead of like hit points or harm or clocks or whatever, we have our conditions which you will mark against your stats. So each stat has a condition that coincides with it. Things like uh, isolated, conflicted. Um, selfish, angry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, despairing. Yeah, mm-hmm. those are the other ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and these impact the the numbers side of things, but they also are supposed to be like role playing um, prompts for you. So if you are angry, like what does that make you feel? How do you feel in this situation since you are mm-hmm. angry? Um, if your friends are trying to like rally about the people, how do you feel if you are conflicted? What do you do in this situation? Um, so conditions are a nice way of kind of not necessarily engaging with our harmony corruption mechanic because sometimes there might be harm that is outside of those two extremes. But like, how do you represent that and have a, a role playing thrust to it? Mm-hmm. And it's also really nice to have those marked when you're going into. Um you know, like the, the first, like if, if it's a multiple session thing, um, when you start out that second or third session, it's like, you can look and go, Oh yeah, these are the things that, you know, my character was struggling with at this point. And then you can reflect that in the sanctuary as you describe it, um, Mm -hmm. in that guided meditation, um, you know, or, or at the end of a session, you can go, Oh, how did my, how is my character feeling at this point compared to when we started? And you have that as like a reference point, um, in a, brief sort of easy to uh track and remember kind of way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh very cool should we get into the fun part i mean are we ready this there's there's a part that's more fun than this (laughs) um well i mean in this next part i will continue to tell you how much i like this game so okay (laughs) then then i think we're set awesome all right (laughs) let's make some people let's make some people oh and a community and a community (laughs) So normally we like to let our guests go first. Um, is there a playbook that either of you would be particularly interested in? I mean, I was thinking the redeemed. Um, it was one of the earliest playbooks and I think has seen some of the most change, I think from hmm. the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, it was originally called the living weapon, um, Interesting. which there's a whole, there's a whole story about that that like kind of ties into the way that we treat violence in the game um, where we we found that people were focusing on that like, oh, this is the fighter or this is the one that, you know, is the tank or what have you. Um, when really what we wanted the story to be about was the choice not to use violence or the consequences thereof mm-hmm. or, you know, having the capability to do that, um, you know, like – this this is something that hit home for me you know i i was i was always a very big guy um and like i had in god it was like third grade or something i had a a friend of mine um and i hurt him on purpose um you know it wasn't anything serious or anything but it was just like i remember that years later you know 30 years later because like i took advantage of the fact that like i was bigger than my friend you know, to, I forget what it was even about, but you know, and it was like, I remember that. And I'm like, I had that feeling of, I had the capacity for violence and I did violence and I still regret that, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's about that story of like, okay, how do you, how do you deal with that? You know, knowing that you are capable of, of that. And, um, you know, in the case of the redeemed, um, the story of that character is, um, you know, you were created to excel at conflict. Um, and it's the, the story of like how you reject that essentially. Very cool. Okay. I'm not crying. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) We haven't even started yet. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Taylor, you talk now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very bossy. I'm I sorry. Would... <laughs> you talk now. I'm not going to do something that like emotional, but um, I think I'd like to be the seeker because mm. we have the one thing that we haven't really talked about in the setting of Descent to Midnight is the mm-hmm. Echo, uh, which is just like the corruption different for every like game and world that we are going to be playing in. It is to me, it's like the world behind worlds. It's what's what you see when you echolocate it is um the impressions that the idea of things leave in your existence um and there's really cool like existential storylines that mm-hmm. you can tell in the echo um especially when you try to balance like harmony and corruption and the seeker is really about kind of navigating the bubble between those worlds so if you think about the like plato's allegory of the cave the seeker might be the person passing the torch by the mouth of the cave um they uh they are the the very few folks um have you know as deep a connection to the echo as the seeker does although everyone can engage with it in some you know some way shape or form uh they are the ones who live in it so i really am am thinking about this character as a like and a very surreal existential mm-hmm. um like abstract character and like again like going back to designing this as a team like it's really cool seeing the different interpretations of the echo mm-hmm. at you know at each of our tables um because you know for rich it's like it can you know how does he de- describe it it's like uh if the physical world is you know the tip of the iceberg the echo is the ocean that it floats in yeah. you know mm-hmm. um you know, you can look at it as, oh, it's another plane of existence. It can be many things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, again, like like the corruption, its strength lies in that, you know, whatever bonkers idea you come to the table with um, and create together, there's always room to tell whatever kind of story will, you know, hit those buttons for you emotionally um, and sort of like bring the group together. Um, and it, it's always different. Mm -hmm. all right how about you amelia um oh gosh i'm thinking about doing the empath nice it's one that seems super interesting to me and i have not gotten to play yet so um it's all about um like channeling emotions and um you this one in particular don't you like absorb the corruption from Mm -hmm. other people yeah. Yeah. So the uh, empath deals with corruption in um, some different ways than other playbooks. So for starters, they have a corruption track that's just longer than everyone else's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they can take more of it uh, into themselves. Um, and I am scrolling to them. Yeah. I mean, the I if I remember correctly, that was the very first playbook that um, the absolute first yep. one ever written <laughs> and. Uh, again, you know, like watching these playbooks evolve has been really cool. Um, you know, I, if I recall, Rich had this idea for like um, sort of a, a an aquatic monk healer type character that, you know, he tried to explore in, in various systems and, you know, doing um, like supplements for D&D um, and had this idea for, oh, OK, this is kind of what this character type is like and then watching that evolve into this um you know at one point there was a it was like um they were characterized as like an emotional vampire i think where it's like if you use it for good you can like you know you can heal people by taking some of that burden away from other people and using it to power you know your your powers to help other people um but if you go too far what does that look like? You know, the, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do with the story of that playbook. I I want to tell you and other people about um, I was my first game. I played with um, Aaron Amendola mm-hmm. and he played the empath and it was I mean, it stuck with me. It was phenomenal. Um, basically, his character was like a therapist and essentially his whole job was to sit and listen to the problems of other people. Mm. But would basically like absorb the emotions of other people. But part of his character Mm -hmm. story was that because of that, like he would reflect to them, like what they looked like and everything is like a comfort thing. But part of that was over time, he had completely forgotten 
what he looked like and how he felt about things and his own memories because he had spent so mm. much time absorbing things from other people. And it was just like mm. fascinating to me. It was like, that's yeah. so cool and interesting and sad. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Ryan, what do you think? Um, I think I'm going to go a little against type here uh, and go oh, with my. the specialist. Ooh, oh. very cool. Mm. Uh, specialist uh, looks like they're an expert at getting people into and out of danger um, or questionable situations. And uh, it looks like they're they're kind of what like the 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 strike task force of uh, the characters. Yeah, Richard talked about like um, you know rescue personnel, um, the special forces. If you know, hesitate to call it that, but like. You know, um, don't get me started on my anthropomorphism speech, yep, Richard. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, you know, like, what you does said, it mean that our world has forces and what does it mean that they're special? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what does anything mean, Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> Not good things. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I know one of the early play tests, um, ended up sort of turning into a weird like shadow run thing of like, you know, a character was grown in a lab and we were going to, you know, take down the, the break into the corporate, uh, arcology or whatever underwater and, and do a thing. And it was like, what does corporate security look like? I guess it's a giant shark, you know, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's evolved from there a little yeah. bit, but yeah. yeah. I don't like this underwater capitalism. Mm-hmm. no, it's real bad. It's just very soggy. Um, <laughs> Paper money is the worst. Capitalism's already bad enough without being soggy. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So from here, what do we do? So once you've chosen your playbooks, um, take a read of their flavor text. Uh, you can even read it out loud at the table. Take a look at your picture. Um, you are not beholden to the art that is on your playbook. And I want to drive that home here. A lot of people have really taken the idea of their character and run a hog wild with it. Um, we don't put a limit on like what your character is or could look like or do anything. Um, so uh, we have had games where, uh, and I, I like to joke and say this is like the quintessential Descent to Midnight Party is mm-hmm. like one person plays an octopus. Like they are an eight-legged cephalopod like pulled out of Earth's ocean and they are playing that octopus because they love octopi mm-hmm. and they are filled with knowledge about octopi that, you know, shocks and awes the table mm-hmm. and it's great. And we have like... Two people that are playing some weird animal hybrids. They've they're like really excited about like different concepts that they're mashing up mm-hmm. together, and that's fen- phenomenal. And then we have one person who like u- usually they go last. <laughs> Taylor, when they tell, <laughs> oh no, I'm being called out. <laughs> um, y- usually it's like the last person to talk about their character, and this is like someone who has just taken like the idea of what a character looks like and just tossed it out the window mm-hmm. and said. I'm playing the concept of mm-hmm. echolocation yes. or I am playing the conne- the interconnectedness of all living things. Like I am playing someone for whom maybe a physical body isn't mm-hmm. necessary mm-hmm. Uh, or like stretching the idea of what a character can be. Like I am playing the turtle on whose back our community grows. Yes. Um, I played a rock last time. <laughs> there's always, <Yeah. laughs> there's always one. Mm-hmm. There's, <laughs> there is always one. And I love it. It's great. Yeah. Um, that's because I'm biased. Yeah, my, my last character was like that. Like the mm-hmm. the organic matter that came out of the hydrothermal vents is where my mm-hmm. consciousness was allowed to flow between. Yeah. So I bring that up because the next thing that we're going to do is choose what our character might look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are three sets of alliterative descriptions. Uh, so, for example, the seeker has three pairs of of words. I could be gelatinous and genial, sharp and shielded, monstrous and majestic. And I think I am going to be gelatinous and genial because I'm going to be playing the, like, the gelatin membrane between our world and the Echo. Like I said, there's always one. (laughs) There's always one. (laughs) And it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, gosh. Uh, so as the redeemed, I've got, uh, the choice of colony of creatures, polished predator, mailed monstrosity, or deceptively delicate. 
Um, and in this case, I think I am going to go with mailed monstrosity. Um, so uh, I, can't, I can't remember if it was the very last game I played or the game before, um, but we had this idea of what does what does a computer network look like or what is sort of the equivalent for like um, storing and uh, disseminating information. Uh, and it was sort of like uh, bivalves and clams and all that. So mm. I've got this idea of this is a... Um, a creature who lives half in the echo and half in the physical world. Um, and their tether to the physical world, um, are discarded bits of organic matter. And for whatever reason, the, um, the bits of organic matter that they latch onto the best are the shells of dead, um, uh, computer clams or whatever we want to call them. Um, so they're like the, the psionic biotech equivalent of a circuit golem Ooh. that hangs out in the next dimension and just sort of happens to have, uh, those shells be its body in the physical world. Nice. And that is definitely male monstrosity. Cause all those shells just sort of floating around. All right. I kind of got my concept. Go for it. I'm still trying to. Okay. For the specialist, uh, between the looks, I have invisible and infinite, beefy and bulbous, or fluid and <laughs> fastidious. I love all of these, but I'm going to go with invisible and infinite. Um, and counter to Taylor's uh, oh. edges, fringes of the echo, I exist along all of the surfaces of the world and i am there to amplify the echo for all of the living creatures in the world so they have a better more harmonious experience with the echo mm. so you're a signal booster effectively a living signal booster that's really cool all right so so no pressure amelia but are we gonna have a party that actually lives mostly in the echo <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like you, y'all are just like, oh yeah, totally. Here's everything, and I'm like, uh. um, I want to go with lithe and lustrous. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, man, I'm having a really hard time with this today. Have you seen frilled sharks? Ooh. No, but I'm gonna Google that now. <laughs> Um, just a quick content warning for anyone trying to Google frilled sharks. They are terrifying. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're real scary. Uh, oh, now I have yeah, to look that's... for this. My goodness. Yep. So, um, do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it's like the naked mole rat of sharks, I would say. It's like, oh, wait, this might not be exactly what I was thinking of. Oh, so you, you have you, any of you all ever seen that Red Sonja movie with um, Bridget Nielsen and Arnold Schwarzenegger? No. That's probably a good thing, but there's a monster <laughs> in that that is basically a giant version of one of these guys. Oh, wait, it is. It's just the first, like, three rows of Google image searches are not as scary <laughs> as they should be. I mean, they're all pretty terrifying. Yeah, I mean, as you get down, um, <clears throat> yep. Oh, boy. That's, yep. um. What is this thing? Oh, my God. Somebody made an origami one. Okay. Sorry. I'm going down the rabbit hole. I'll see you all in a couple <laughs> hours. All right. Let's know how it goes. <laughs> Um, I want to, because I'm stuck on this word lustrous, so I want something, like, iridescent. Um, mm. I, but I don't want to be a jellyfish. Okay, I'm, I'm back. I'm going to be good. <laughs> it's taking um, everything, but I will do it. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> Bookmarks, that's what those are for. Yes. I'm slowing it down. Oh! Well, how abstract do you want to get? Well, I mean, everybody else is pretty abstract. I mean, I feel like you could be the one in the party, too, where it's like, I'm a sea otter because they're friggin' cute. <laughs> <laughs> I I really want to be a clam of some sort. Ooh. <gasps> Ooh. Mm. Um, and yeah, with like sort of a pearlescent outside. Nice. Um, mm. But also really sharp teeth. That's important. Oh, nice. yeah. A bitey clam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to be, I'm going to, that's how we'll describe it. I am a live and lustrous bitey clam. <laughs> Love it. 
Amazing. So we've got one uh, physical connection to the world. And so we're back to the, there's always one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Why do you got... Just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and went last as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Symmetry in all things. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we got to read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. <laughs> Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like A Woman with Hollow Eyes. A Woman with Hollow Eyes is a podcast adaptation of One Shot's live stream Dramatic Invisible Sun actual play. Discover a world of magic, secrets, and supernatural civic disputes in our unique take on Saturine. In the first season, James D'Amato, Cat Cool, and SNL writer Alan Linnick are led on a mind-bending adventure by GM Darcy Ross. Even if you already saw the streams, you want to listen to this podcast for the incredible soundtrack, composed and edited by Will Levendahl. Get it by searching for A Woman with Hollow Eyes or Darcy Ross on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app.